thanks for coming to hear this story about uh, eunuchs, genital emasculation, and extreme sexual side of dimorphism is spiders. I will introduce not spiders in general, but one clade within the orb weaver that is uh, my pet clade that I keep working on. It's just, um, it just so cool. These are nephilids, and particularly the genus Nephila. Uh, you may know the golden orb weaver. This is this genus, and in fact, coastal North Carolina is uh, the northernmost uh, place where you can potentially see them every now and then in the northern hemisphere. They are known for gigantic webs. The females are really, really giant. And you can see how scared my uh, <laughs> colleague Inge is looking at one of these guys that we discovered in Seychelles. And their males, though, are, are very small. So, so it's, it's a typical model system to address questions about sexual size dimorphism and how it comes about and how it is made. Nephila is <coughs> iconic, it's um, quite a model organism if there is such a thing in arachnids. Uh, we have a fairly good idea of its taxonomy, it's more or less revised. Uh, and we also just published on its phylogeny, so, so we, we know pretty well um, how species of Nephila and Nephilids are related. Uh, they show a whole range of sexual size dimorphism not only this extreme case that I've shown, uh, but it ranges uh, from almost monomorphic to slightly dimorphic to highly dimorphic. And uh, there's just a lot that's going on in Nephila research. I will briefly introduce to you some of the sexual phenotypes, behaviors, repertoires, what have you. Uh, one is male accumulation. It's a phenomenon where Several of these tiny males uh, accumulate around a single female. The other is opportunistic mating, when the male, which is small and matures much earlier than the giant female, uh, seeks one before she finally mounts to maturity and guards her and then opportunistically mates over and over uh, with her whilst, while she is still uh, defenseless in town. We also have mate guarding, which can be pre- or post populatory You can see one tiny male just sitting on, on the female that he claims is his own. Uh, we have mate binding, uh, when a tiny male in between bouts of copulation walks around the female and just wraps her in very thin and flimsy silk. Uh, we regularly observe genital mutilation, which is, um, this here is a picture of a broken pedipod. It's a sexual uh, organ, it's a secondary sexual organ, it's paired and some males just break it and plug with the breakage uh, the female uh, copulatory openings. And finally, <laughs> the same species uh, end up emasculating themselves, so that's when the males simply drop off the entire organ um, after having damaged it. And I will talk today about the evolution of emasculation in spiders, that's this, and um, its relation to sexual cannibalism and uh, how it all relates to, to SSD, which is sexual side damage. So I will try to make a point that these phenotypes um, co-evolve not only in the Philid spiders, but in spiders in general. Sexual size dimorphism simply means that uh, the two sexes differ dramatically in size. It can be moderate, it can be extreme, but uh, in an evolutionary sense, it implies that there was a monomorphic ancestor somewhere in the tree of life and uh, that, that, that when dimorphism evolves one of the sexes or both of the sexes change size in any direction. So there's a bunch of selection types and selection pressures that can operate <laughs> and create um, SSD so the evolutionary outcome is usually referred to either as uh, male gigantism or female gigantism or 
because sometimes in the spider literature we encounter male dwarfism, which would imply that the males have reduced in size in evolutionary time, or of course there can be a combination of them. And uh, in the spider SSD literature, we sort of come to the conclusion that most of the cases are due to, to female, females becoming big, so female gigantism, and sometimes in combination with the males reducing in size. This is a phylogeny that, that we published on this group. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but suffice it to say that we now have uh, branch length information, which we had been lacking before to, to do some comparative analysis. And we have shown before, but on a much simpler phylogeny that lacked these branch lengths, that male and female sizes were not correlated on the phylogeny in the fillets, and that the females were the ones that monotonically increased in size during evolution. And recently we can confirm this trend uh, that the females and male sizes are independent, they're not phylogenetically correlated. Um, but we cannot um, simply repeat any of the known models of the evolution. Uh, instead, we talk now about sexually dimorphic gigantism, which just means that both sexes during the evolutionary time increase in size, but the slopes differ significantly. So here's just a few ways of, of showing the same thing, but on X we, we have some sort of um, time or, or time proxy through phylogenetic time. And the size in, in the females is on an increase, and the size of the males is also on an increase, but a very slight increase. So the difference, of course, is SSD. And so now we have to explain a way why the males are not following the females fully, why their um, size evolution is still, is still uh, independent from the female one. Now let's go back to eunuchs, to spider emasculation. Uh, we talk about half eunuchs, which is a case when they only drop one of the paired copulatory organs, or so-called full eunuchs, when they choose to drop both. Uh, so we, through the years, developed a number of hypotheses, which are not mutually exclusive. Um, and so we call them the plugging hypothesis, the better fighter hypothesis, the gloves off hypothesis and remote population. And we now have some solid evidence for most of them. Uh, we have shown that their plugs, before they drop off their sexual organs, the plugs they create are effective uh, to prevent the female from remating. We have support for the better fighter hypothesis, although not in both species that we've tested so far. Actually, we now have the evidence for three out of two out of three, and so we just showed in, in a bunch of lab tests. I don't know if this is playing uh, that. Well, I'll just tell you what this video is showing. You have to believe me. That the small eunuch who had dropped the pups uh, very aggressively. Uh, persists in the female web to chase off any incoming rival. Uh, the, the rivals, which are intact, they haven't mated yet, um, are more cautious and independent of their size, the, the eunuchs usually just simply chase them away. There is solid evidence for the gloves off hypothesis, which simply says that uh, after the males had damaged their pods, that it's in their benefit to simply um, get rid of them because they're a significant weight to their, to their uh, movement impairing their fighting abilities. And finally, there's evidence for remote copulation, which um, I'll show you, um, which means that when the male had broken off its pulp, this pulp continues to pump out sperm into the penis after the male can be gone or eaten. Uh, so it's a sort of a it's a graph that shows you um, that the sperm is continuously pumped. 
So we have to conclude from this that emasculation as, as a behavior is adaptive, and it's adaptive in several ways, although uh, some species show slightly different results in this respect, and that these are male adaptations to sexual conflict. I have to stress, of course, that we're talking about spider emasculation. Uh, sometimes I get emails from people that study genital mutilation in humans, so we're not studying human genital damage or human eunuchs. Anyway, looking a little broadly at the spider phylogeny, we were able to redefine emasculation and, and plot it on, on the most updated phylogeny of all spiders. And uh, now we talk about three types, uh, depending on, on when precisely emasculation happens. And we were able to show that the behavior is confined to one single clade of spiders, uh, to arachnoids, these are the orb weavers. But within that clade, um, the behavior repeatedly evolves up to 11 times, and then there are further modifications, losses, etc. When uh, doing comparative tests on all spiders, we were able to show, with using three different methods, that there is a positive correlation between the evolution of emasculation and the evolution of sexual size dimorphism. And while other research has shown <coughs> that SSD uh, in spiders correlates with sexual cannibalism, uh, we also get this result plus, it's not only SSD plus cannibalism, but it's also, there's a, there's a correlation uh, also with uh, genital damage and especially with full emasculation. So now we talk about the SSD mating syndrome, and by that we mean what I, how, what I started, is that these phenotypes are correlated, and I'm going a step further to, to hypothesize or uh, that, that SSD may be the cause to, towards evolving all these uh, phenotypes quite predictably, and not only sexual cannibalism and genital dam damage and emasculation, but perhaps also um, these others, male accumulation, male guarding, male binding, and opportunistic mating, and yeah, the biology of these, uh, of these uh, behaviors already hinted that, but now we're able to show that phylogenetically. To summarize what, what I tried to convey to you today is um, that there's a, a bit of a new pattern in, in spider SSD research, which is now called sexually dimorphic gigantism, which means that both sexes grow, uh, but quite independently one from the other. However, uh, some of you may have seen the talk by Ren Chung Cheng yesterday on a different group of spiders that cannot recover any of these patterns. So, so, so this pattern is, is clearly not universal for spiders. Uh, we also conclude that emasculation is adaptive and we find clear support for the plugging hypothesis, better fighter hypothesis, gloves off hypothesis and remote population, and that in spiders SSD evolution and emasculation evolution are clearly uh, correlated and, and there are more phenotypes that also correlate with that which we refer to as the SSD mating syndrome. So this would suggest some sort of a concerted evolution of traits that arise through a combination of sexual and natural selection and one of the major four still may be fecundity, natural selection, but there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of them, there's a cocktail of them. We've, uh, been publishing on, on this group of spiders and on all spiders and please feel free to browse through our website. And with that, again, thank you very much for taking your time. So we'll move on to the next talk.